Hi everyone, this is the Jenkins Documentation Special Interest Group. It's the 27th of March, 2020. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the agenda and then we'll uh, work through the contents of the agenda. So first, first item, we'll report on previous action items. Then we'll talk about plug-in labeling principles and guidelines. Um, then the plug-in adoption and deprecation processes. Then documentation roadmap. And uh, those are the, oh, and then Google season of docs 2020. Are there other topics that should be added to the agenda? Not for me. Great, okay, then let's go ahead. And uh, first is the action items. Um, I apologize, I'm still not, I still haven't submitted my project ideas in a pull request. I think what will happen there is we're going to use the roadmap as a place to hold some of those, um, at least as an initial capture, and then we'll put more ideas as they gather. Uh, doc SIG summary, I continue to post those to post the videos to Twitter and I'll do a blog post here in the next week or two on the ways the docs have evolved. Uh, Oleg, you and I had talked about a POM and BOM developer meetup for um, the, for, for use of Bill of Materials in Maven. Any sense, is, is that stabilizing now or should we continue to hold this on the do it in the future? I think that we need to do that. Um, I'm about uh, releasing plugin POM 4.0. So it's on my list uh, maybe for the next week or uh, maybe every week after. And after it happens, we can definitely proceed uh, with uh, the meetup for that. Great, and okay. While we are waiting for that, uh, everybody is welcome to join and talk about uh, uh, anything else related to plugin development. So we had three or four meetups already. And we got some audience today. Um, yeah, that is interesting in these topics because it's not only about Jenkins but also about the usage of software development tools. So even if you don't develop uh, Jenkins plugins, you can study something from that. Excellent, thank you. Mm. Then the last item was on listing the GitHub apps and the plugins that use them. I, I don't remember, I don't have recall the details on this one. Should I just delete this item? No, you don't need. So it came from the request to clarify uh, which applications uh, can be used by plugin developers. And uh, the current situation that uh, a common plugin maintainer cannot access the list of already approved uh, applications. So we need to somehow document it, probably in the .github repository. Ah, uh, okay. So this is... So I, as a plugin developer, don't know that release drafter is available to me or that, some, or uh, let's see, what are some others, some of the, the ProBot um, tools, the, the thing that does DependBot, for instance. And if I don't know they're, they're available, I need to see a list somewhere. Okay. Yeah, so it's something uh, on the back burner for me. Uh, I will eventually do that, but you're yeah, taking all the other action items on my side. I wouldn't expect it soon. Right. Unless uh, there is strong need to have that. And, and I, I haven't seen, seen strong need to have it, so that seems very reasonable. Mm -hmm. All right, so next topic, plug-in labeling guidelines, uh, labeling principles. So the story here is that previously, Jenkins plugins were categorized by um, by labels that were stored at one point on the wiki and after the wiki was no longer particularly helpful. Let's see, and Oleg, if I've got the right location, the labels are right over here. And I can use those to, to find all the plugins that match a particular label. And storing them in the wiki, the wiki is now read only, so that won't work anymore. Um, GitHub has a concept of topics. And so plugins can be, have topics controlled by the plugin maintainer, which, which are the, can be used as labels 
to help people find things better on the on the plugin site. So one of the one of the discussions was, hey, are we do we have the right techniques for labeling plugins? And so I had sent out a proposal here, which suggested ah, discard, which suggested some ideas for oh, that's impossible to read ideas for guidelines we might use in labeling things because Oleg and I had a discussion about, hey, we, what are the appropriate labels to use and not use on a, on a particular plugin? So the principles I was proposing were, let's try to label for users. And by default, we would only label from with whitelisted labels, so labels that are chosen in advance. And skip, this one was, I think, a controversial one, skip labels provided by parents. And then, then the other controversial one was, labels should be relevant to at least five plugins before they are added to the whitelist. Um, Oleg, you and I had conversations about this. This is probably a good time for me to ask you to chime in. Uh, what are some issues you'd seen, some problems or things you think we need to address here in the discussion? Yeah, so in this discussion, basically we need to um, agree how we label things, because uh, there are two approaches. Um, my concern about this proposal was not specifically to the list, uh, but to, uh, the suggestions below regarding principles. So for example, how to label plugins uh, for GitHub and et cetera. Because your approach, uh, Mark, is to label everything which might be useful to a GitHub user. Right. My approach uh, was to label plugins which are specifically related uh, to GitHub. And uh, yeah, there is uh, basically a uh, conceptual difference in how the labels would be displayed. Uh, right now, how, well, how labels were organized before, we were actually um, uh, we were focusing on technologies. So, for example, all plugins which are um, providing some functionality for Kubernetes would be marked with Kubernetes label. One of the uh, ones we added recently to highlight uh, such feature areas. But uh, yeah, my approach basically follows uh, the one which existed before, and my understanding, Mark, that you propose a different approach. Right, that, a good point. So a key difference there was should so in in your in your in the in the the way it's been in the past it's not even particularly yours right it's that how we've applied it in the past a plugin that was specifically focused on github would be labeled github whereas this this example basic build branch build strategies would not be labeled github github did i understand correctly uh, yes that's right So, so this may be a place where where others are certainly welcome to chime in. I'm okay with either. I think it would be perfectly fine to say, "Hey, we're not we're we're going to say you, it needs to be specific to that technology." In in the specific benefit labeling technique, oh, like do you envision how they would find basic branch build strategies? Would they find it by some other means? Mm, yeah, because uh, there are still additional labels like SCM, uh, which could be used. Then uh, later we could uh, add some uh, analytics because we have usage stats. So, for example, we could uh, provide information like uh, people who install uh, GitHub branch source plugin usually install these basic uh, branch build strategies, something like that. So how other marketplaces like Amazon operate? Okay, so the, there we we would use the use the data after the initial labeling. Use the data that that can be gathered from the association of plugins in an installation. I'm not I'm not sure I'm clear on where we get that data. Yep, uh, association or maybe just documentation references or whatever. Uh, but yeah, for me it's. Uh, how it would be done practically because otherwise you have explosion of configurations uh, for example everybody uses pipeline not everybody but yeah 70 percent of jenkins users 
so would you mark uh, all um, pipeline plugins with GitHub label? Because yeah, if you use GitHub, you would definitely benefit from pipeline. So mm. such approach causes a lot of pitfalls like that. And I would um, prefer to be careful about that unless uh, there is strong documentation uh, where, where the boundary is. Good, good point. So we have a, we have a pool of 1,500, 18, 1,000, almost 2,000 plugins. And you're right that if, if the, the, this, this tends to be a broader proposal than, and it would thus tend to generate many, many hits on, on the word pipeline, or the word, if, if the example you give, pipeline, pipeline label is assigned to every plugin that provides anything, any extension to pipeline, then when I search for pipeline, I will probably get almost every plugin in the system. I'll get hundreds and hundreds of them, and that's, that's not particularly valuable to me. Good, exactly. okay. So yeah, that's uh, was my point about that. Uh, and yeah, my preference would be to proceed to this how Jenkins uh, operated before, and uh, it uh, would be also more convenient for maintainers because uh, we expect uh, plugin maintainers to manage GitHub topics. Yeah, I use my uh, GitHub work admin permissions to set topics where um, I feel it's reasonable, uh, but uh, in general, it's up to uh, plugin maintainers. So if you set up a complicated policy, it won't help. Well, and and maybe is it would it even be simpler then to say, hey, we're not going to worry about a policy particularly. We will allow it to grow entirely organically, and thus it would follow the pattern that we've used in the past. Or do you do you feel strongly that hey, a stated policy will help even if the stated even if the stated policy is specifically to continue as we did before. I wouldn't spend too much time on that. We definitely need some kind of summary in uh, plugin developer and plugin maintainer documentation mm -hmm. because right now we don't document uh, that uh, one can use GitHub topics uh, on the documentation. It's not a big deal because uh, many popular plugins do use labels. So uh, people will discover that they actually make some effect uh, and now it's also visible in the Jenkins front end because um, the same labels are consumed from update center by Jenkins installations. Uh, but still some kind of documentation would be nice. For example, um, in hosting session, uh, sections, so when you submit your plugin, you can also set up labels, etc. Uh, but I wouldn't expect to have a strict process or job for that, because it's basically a set of guidelines. Good, okay. And I, I think I think I've understood more clearly now your your re, your rationale, and I'm fine with that. How about if we put the action item on me? Or are there others in the meeting that would like to comment, uh, give insights on? Hey, I would like this or that. And we have Daniel on the call, and Daniel spends a lot of time on uh, Jenkins plugin manager. Uh, hi, uh, sorry, I had to accept delivery just now. Um, where exactly are we regarding the rules here? So the idea was to bias instead of instead of taking the rules as the patterns that I had suggested, we stay with Jenkins' more common way of doing things, which is if a plugin specifically focuses on delivering a capability to a particular keyword, GitHub in this example, mm -hmm. it would be labeled with that. But in this example, right. basic branch build strategies would not be labeled GitHub because it's okay. not specific. Um, thank you. Uh, that is what I would also have suggested because what would happen is basic branch build strategies would get two dozen labels for every implementation of SCM that is compatible with it, and that would seem very weird to me. So uh, I agree with this. Um, I only have one sp other specific feedback, if I may. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, uh, I don't think we should, um, this specific example that's currently being screen shared looks like fairly 
strict restrictive rules about plugin labeling, which seems to go counter to uh, where we're going with the labeling by supporting GitHub topics, which is a lot more organic and allowing people to just, you know, add labels they think make sense within the whitelist constraints, obviously. Um, but there seems to be a tension here between we want strict control, that's the correct label, that would be an incorrect label. And on the other hand, yeah, I mean, we support GitHub topics, you can define your own, just do whatever. And I'm not quite sure what the direction here is. Well, so and my, my, my intent in describing these was only to give samples and not to state them as rules, rather as samples. And I think given the guidance from both you and from Oleg, that we should be more, more, more Jenkins style of let's be, accept that this will be organic, that it will be flexible. So what I was thinking I should do is offer a pull request to the, to the developer docs page on hosting that says that, hey, you can use labels and you should choose the labels from the whitelist and you may and bias towards and yeah bias towards fewer labels not not being overly broad and focus on the value that your plugin is giving to the user so keep it very simple no no strict rules described no no rigorous enforcement of anything but um as an addition to that I think it makes sense to encourage users to propose new labels to be uh, whitelisted. Um, because, I mean, we don't know everything. Maybe a new niche uh, is created in terms of Jenkins plugins, multiple plugins. Like if you think back five years or something, there was like probably like one Docker plugin or something. And at some point there would have been this critical mass of five Docker plugins um, where a label makes sense. Um, so yeah, uh, totally agree. And um, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if I can capture that. I'm gonna actually put it into a, an action item here. So uh, Mark to submit, Mark submit a PR to the dev docs. The, uh, that proposes that says GitHub topics are uh, supported and encouraged. Um, topics that match a whitelist will be displayed on plugins.jenkins.io. Uh, encourage proposals, encourage proposed proposals to add to the whitelist. And um, suggest that uh, labels focus on the key value provided to the user. Is that a reasonable way to say it, or how would you how would you suggest? I, I would suggest using a word other than key there. Ah, oh, good. Okay, how about just that? Yeah, that works. Right. Basically, what we're trying to say here is labels are when users are looking for something, or administrators are looking for something but they don't know exactly what they're looking for, but rather, you know, the general topic, the category, the technology, stuff like that. Um, and yeah, so uh, labels should focus on that. Nobody cares the about the technology that your plugin is implemented in, right. but if you, or the build system that you're using. So limit your use of the Maven label to, you know, Maven specific features in Jenkins and right. not, you know, because you have a POM XML. Right, well, or, or I like the, the one that Oleg and I discussed earlier was 
it should not be that the that every plugin that extends pipeline uses the pipeline label because if every plugin that extends pipeline uses the pipeline label the set of labeled pipeline the pipeline label will become almost useless there are so many things in it is that yeah, a fair I mean, example um, daniel or by by now pipeline as a label is akin to labeling a Jenkins plugin using Jenkins, Jenkins. and plugin. Right, which exactly. Makes no sense inside Jenkins. Right. Um, right. Obviously, uh, is Pipeline a whitelisted label? It probably is, right? It, it because... is. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, whether it, uh, it's any value, it's an uh, arguable topic because right now there are maybe 60 or so plugins. Uh, but yeah, in principle, there is label for that. Although, but with only 60, that's not as bad as I had feared because I think if we looked at implement, those who are implementing pipeline, it's probably double or triple that. Yeah, because not everybody puts the pipeline topic. That's easy. Right. Yeah, this, uh, so I spent some time to clean up common labels like Kubernetes, AWS, OpenShift, monitoring, whatever. I invested some time to put these uh, uh, GitHub topics, but yeah, please be sure that I wasn't going through all pipeline plugins because practical value for this label is not that high. Maybe Maybe something like the following makes sense. Use labels for if if the plugin is well above average related to the label because if you just implement simple build step and are pipeline compatible that's not well above average but if you're you know an actual pipeline plugin then the label would be redundant but it wouldn't actually make sense um Something along those lines, perhaps. Good. I like that guidance. Excellent. Um, and and I mean, ultimately, it's it's not just it's just that uh, what's that philosophical? Do what everyone would be able to do, and the outcome of that would be reasonable. Um, if everyone labeled their vaguely related plugin with pipeline, the label would be useless. Um, so maybe we can work this nicely to explain the principle. Good, yeah, I like that, okay. Thanks, excellent. Okay, thanks for the extra time here. Um, I, I propose we move on to the next topic. I think I've got, I'm settled on the, on the discussion, the next stop will be a, a pull request. Any objections to that? Mm, that's fine. Uh, so one thing which I would explicitly reserve in the documentation you create that uh, Jenkins GitHub work admins uh, reserve their right uh, to manage labels uh, for plugins without asking for permission. So for example, in the case of uh, GitHub topic vandalism or in the case of when we just Feel it's reasonable to um, add a label and to uh, help maintainers. We can do that uh, without uh, really consulting with maintainers. It seems very reasonable. Yep. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. It's not how we commonly approach uh, the plugin ecosystem, but since uh, it goes directly uh, to update center. Maybe it's something uh, we need to mark explicitly. Right. I, I think I think say, saying may uh, or are allowed to is is very fair. I think that's a reasonable thing to tell them that if if there is some reason, and typically org admins don't don't act act that way unless there's a motivating reason. Good. Thanks. Okay, next topic, new plugin adoption and deprecation processes. Oleg, would you like to take us through this one? Yeah. Let's see, let me stop sharing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I spent some time preparing uh, uh, 
pages before the meeting and then I closed everything. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you see my screen? Do, yes, yes. thanks. Okay, so while we're here, let me show you labels, how they look on the plugin side, because yeah, we spoke a lot about uh, how to label that. But yeah, from the user perspective, it looks like that. Uh, you can uh, look for plugins, and uh, here you can discover uh, plugins which are related to Kubernetes. I just uh, launched the search, and here you can see that there is 18 plugins. You can see that uh, there are labels. So not uh, all plugins are labeled so far. So there is still some technical depth in terms of labeling. But if you launch this query, you can also discover uh, plugins which are related to Kubernetes. And you can uh, do it for common queries. So we spent a lot of time uh, updating whitelist. So you can find it. Uh, yeah, there is still some gaps here and there. But uh, we built, um, uh, we just help uh, to make the plugin discoverable. Um, there are two uh, specific cases uh, related to plugins at the moment. One is uh, deprecation. So it's deprecated uh, um, uh, plugins, plugins which are no longer supposed to be used by users due to whatever reason. Uh, this listing doesn't include uh, the publishing plugin, the published plugins. So, for example, if the Jenkins security team decides to depublish plugin because of a critical issue, if we, or if it gets removed uh, from the Jenkins Update Center because maintainers decide to do so, then uh, this plugin is not listed. But there are some plugins which you still can install, but uh, which are marked as deprecated. And if you navigate there, you uh, get a warning that yes, it's deprecated. So with uh, what we had um, on the wiki and what we have now on the plugin side. Uh, same for plugin adoption. There is a special label called Adopt This Plugin, uh, which basically lists uh, plugins which are up, uh, for adoption. And right now there are 77 plugins which are marked like that. There is a pull request from Daniel, which adds a couple of hundred more. Also, I have a, a follow-up to do task to add uh, uh, plugins from Nicola, and we still need to update this list, but at least it makes uh, the plugins discoverable. And same here, you uh, get a warning. Yes? So all of Nicola's plugins should be in my pull request mm -hmm. because I batch removed him from the uploaders list uh, in response to his devless threat. Mm -hmm. So when you said he's formerly a maintainer and you contacted him, he wasn't. He was already removed from the plugin. Okay. So yeah, the problem is that he's not explicitly marked. Uh, uh, the plugins are not explicitly marked for adoption. Uh, we have this case for Docker Java API, I believe. Uh, so it's Docker Java API plugin, which is used, for example, in Docker plugin. And yeah, this plugin is not marked for adoption, but now we know that it's up for adoption. And for example, how to fix it quickly, uh, right now using GitHub topics, uh, if you have right permissions in the repository, you can just put adopt uh, this plugin label. And after that, uh, you just save it. And uh, after some time, Jenkins Update Center will pick it up. Uh, it takes a while now, maybe up to 24 hours. It has some notion of uh, eventual consistency because uh, plugin installation manager on the static side, it has multiple containers running and serving the request. So sometimes uh, not everything gets updated at once, but eventually you get it updated and you will get this label on the plugin interface. And yeah, if you're a plugin maintainer, it's just a few clicks um, uh, within uh, GitHub and you get it running. So yeah, that's how it works. So here you can see that there is Docker, there is API plugin, and there is Adopt this plugin label. And if you go to the plugin interface, now you see that there is API plugin and Docker. So both of these labels actually came from GitHub because we annotated them at some point. And uh, yeah, that's how Common Engine works. Uh, going back to adoption and deprecation, uh, I spent some time to document uh, the process. Yeah, it's basically uh, at uh, one GitHub topic, uh, but um, uh, we needed to migrate uh, the old guidelines uh, from Wiki and also to extend them according to the current process. So on the uh, Jenkins documentation side, now you uh, 
can we find a refresh to documentation which targets uh, GitHub specifically. It still uh, references label definitions as a plan B. So you can uh, go and set up a label explicitly in the this uh, center resources if you don't want to use GitHub topics. Sometimes it's reasonable, for example, uh, there might be a duplicated plugin uh, with archived code and basically you just can set a GitHub label or you have a multimodal repository and you want to duplicate on the particular plugin. Again, you cannot do it uh, using GitHub topics. But for such cases, you have an escape hash like uh, this file. Though well, the most of these labels uh, are added for historical reasons. When we were migrating out of Wiki, uh, thanks to Daniel, uh, he uh, generated this file. So this file was basically our dump of uh, labels set up on Wiki. So our adoption processes uh, document some other bits. Uh, so for example, common topics, how can I mark plugin for adoption? Uh, and it's not only about setting a label, we also recommend uh, uh, to update documentation if you want to set specific uh, information. For example, I'm actually looking for home ID or something like that. And you're recommended to, to send a message to the mailing list because we had cases when somebody wanted to step down then you send a message and uh, you find uh, new maintainers who are interested. So instead of just stepping down and disappearing, you can uh, organize some knowledge transfers and it helps the community a lot. And uh, yeah, there are also other such bits, but basically all this information comes from Wiki and it was uh, please lifted to reflect the new process. And it, you can also uh, yeah, need to remove this query entirely because it's not longer needed. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the documentation is up to date. It's exactly the same for deprecation and the removal of plugins. So we spend some time to document it. Again, you just put a topic. It's recommended uh, to update plugin documentation to highlight why it's deprecated. And then it's recommended to release the plugin because um, in Jenkins ecosystem, we rely on documentation as code coming from GitHub. So our recommendation is when we deprecate the plugin, you actually do a final release uh, so that people can see that, uh, uh, that uh, this documentation on the front end. Well, and I believe that, for instance, when FineBugs plugin and PMD were deprecated in favor of warnings NG, that final release gave some hint to the user, didn't it? Didn't it? That hey, that the new plugin is this. Yeah, we can uh, take a look. So here, one interesting thing, you can see that uh, that is deprecated and there is Tombstone uh, readme supplied by uh, Uli Hafner, I believe. So here, yeah, the plugin has reached uh, end of life. So that's it. And I believe that, it, yeah, it comes from GitHub. And I believe Uli did it without actually releasing the plugin because it's also possible to just uh, guide update center uh, to supply uh, to write wiki URLs. Got it. Um, yeah, so for those who are not in, uh, familiar with that, there is a file called uh, uh, wiki overrides where you can basically set custom locations for documentation sources if the common Jenkins plugin discovery engine doesn't work. And here you can see that yeah, this is a patch by Ulde, so he just redirected on the, all the plugins to the basically GitHub readings. Uh, without uh, releasing these plugins. I did the same later for JavaScript libraries. And here you can see that I actually reference a readme file not in the root, but it still works. And yeah, I believe that in the future we will need to get rid of all this stuff and uh, migrate it uh, to GitHub. Yeah, we get contributions, so we gradually migrated the things. So I hope that uh, this list will finally contain only GitHub URLs for plugins which are no longer used. Thank you. Okay, so I guess that's it uh, with adoption and deprecation. Um, yeah, everything is recoverable, but the guidelines are here, and if there are plugin maintainers who are willing to provide some feedback, it will be much appreciated. So a side note on deprecation. Mm -hmm. I currently have pull requests in flight that would slightly change how deprecation works. Um, mm -hmm. specifically deprecation 
would also be possible for plugins that are no longer being distributed, uh, where the benefit is if a Jenkins instance has a plugin installed. Right now, uh, the problem is if we then suspend distribution, um, we cannot provide any information about that plugin anymore other than uh, security uh, issue notifications. Mm -hmm. And deprecation specifically would work similar in that it would not be part of the regular available version metadata, but rather beside it. And that would allow us to show deprecation inside Jenkins, even for plugins not currently being distributed. Mm -hmm. And the current proposed approach would also have a deprecation URL, which would probably typically link to plugin documentation, but there can be other sources, for example, when we suspend plugin distribution because of a security issue. So, um, that may change soon. As I said, it's currently open pull requests um, um, and uh, may or may not change. Yeah, I think it's a great improvement because yeah, right now, if you republish a plugin, you cannot discover it at all. And uh, if you generate tombstones, it will be uh, helpful for everyone. Yeah, thanks for doing that. Yeah, so so Daniel, then what you've that your pull request proposes a, a UI improvement to Jenkins that will for the user actually tell them that they are using something that is now deprecated. I mean, in that it already exists to an extent, but oh, it does. I mean, uh, there is an open pull request by Tim, I think, uh, or. Uh, Joseph, I'm not entirely sure right now, um, who implement that the straightforward way, similar to how we recently did uh, adopt this plugin, uh, where you look for the plugin label in the updates in the metadata. Uh, yes, that's that's it. Mm -hmm. um, um, and if the label exists you highlight it very visibly in Jenkins with an admin monitor and such. And my feedback to that pull request in its current form is it's not enough because we need to label plugins that are deprecated and no longer being distributed. Um, and so uh, there are two parts to this. One part is the server side and updates in the two in which we need to add an additional kind of data to the updates in the JSON file um, and allow it to be configured via property file or JSON file or whatever, nobody cares, um, so that you can also add the label to plugins whose distribution is currently suspended. Um, that's the server side. And then client side, we need to extend Jenkins to consume the new metadata um, and adapt uh, uh, Jettison's uh, pull request to make use of that new metadata as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a similar cycle to what we did for a lot of labels and metadata updates, but it's quite straightforward. Got it, okay, thank you. Thanks for that clarification. So it's the your pull, pull request is really about getting the extra data for a type of uh, thing that does not exist today in Jenkins. The notion that a plugin has been removed from the update center, and we need to alert them that it was removed, that it's been depublished. Right, because there is some overlap between a public plugin whose uh, publication uh, whose publication is suspended or distribution is suspended, and deprecated plugins. And the current approach with the deprecated label that's implemented in the pull request. And I mean, to an extent, it's also implemented right now in Jenkins because you can look at what the deprecated label is, but it's not highlighted in any way. Um, you will only see that for plugins that we currently distribute. And there's a way above average chance uh, that the plugin that's uh, deprecated is also no longer being distributed. 
because if the service it integrates with has been shut down, um, there's no reason to continue uh, distributing it other than to inform users that, well, you, this plugin no longer does anything and can be removed. So yeah, uh, it's, it's an open, oh yeah, that's, so that's the ignore list and there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, many of them, um, due to services being shut down, sure. a few got renamed back uh, when that was easily and accidentally even possible because we had no fine-grained uh, upload permissions uh, years ago. Um, specific, specific releases don't really matter. Uh, and then, of course, there's um, plugins that are suspended because um, of severe security vulnerabilities. Yeah, so this list is quite long. Uh, but yeah. And there I am. I can see myself right in that list. Yeah, thank you. Oh, OK. <laughs> severe, severe problems are expressed in this, this list. Yep. Yeah, whatever. OK, All so. Shame. <laughs> Exactly. Well, anyway, this this thing helps. And, yeah, we can uh, really uh, make some use of that. So yeah, thanks, Daniel, for the heads up. I think it would be a really good improvement for the plugin uh, tooling. Right, and um, while we're talking about adopt this plugin, that's mm -hmm. now I think already in the latest weekly. You mean uh, adopt uh, this plugin label visualization? Yeah, that's in two two twenty seven. Uh, it, it should be. So also related to this, and it was just simpler to do than, um, mm -hmm. yeah, the last one there. Uh, I have screenshots, so yeah, that's why I use GitHub releases because it's easier to navigate the uh, they pull requests uh, contain screenshots. Uh, the link is also in the Jenkins change log. Um, so yeah, this is this this works similar to what Jetterson's current pull request is for deprecation, because if if something's up for adoption, it's typically not suspended. Now that's not true a hundred percent of the case, uh, but a uh, hundred percent of the time. But I think it's close enough that this one makes more sense to have for just uh, distributed plugins and we can always later extend it as well. Close one. Yeah, so the, the next LTS that this will be included in is probably three months away, right? So this will, this will have time to soak for a period of, of multiple weeklies. Great, thank you. Yep. There's a lot of other changes. So yeah, let's see where it evolves. Okay, we are slowly running out of time for this meeting and we still have uh, two items on the agenda. So Mark, what would be your proposal about them? So let's, I'd say, let's take on, let me get a look at those agenda items. Um, Jenkins roadmap and Google season of docs. I'm right. not sure that uh, any of them uh, can be discussed in a couple of minutes. Right. Well, let's, how about, uh, I had intentionally to set this meeting back to once every four weeks. What if we say we'll meet again in two weeks and discuss those two topics? Uh, is that, well, actually, season of docs, I look, hmm, so Oleg, roadmap? Yeah, yeah roadmap, uh, if possible, I would prefer to discuss it next week or start the synchronous discussion in the mailing list. Because we can uh, proceed a lot without a meeting there. Yeah, let's. I think let's do roadmap discussions on the mailing list. It's a good place to do it, and I would like to do. I think the same thing with season of docs, in part because I would love for the Jenkins project to be part of season of docs. But I personally don't have capacity to run Google season of docs. So what I was going to do is post to the mailing list that we we think it would be a good thing, but. It's not going to work if I have to run it. And so if someone would like to assist and, 
and lead the effort. Google Season of Docs is a fascinating opportunity that Google provides to encourage professional technical writers to, who, who may not have open source experience to contribute to open source. It's different for me than, than Summer of Code, right? It's, it's not targeting students. It's really targeting people who are already in the technical writing field. But therefore, it has some different needs and some different expectations. Yeah, but anyway, they need mentors because uh, engaging with open source community is completely different from professional duties or for um, freelancing in terms of communications, in terms of how things happen, the cadence of changes being integrated. So we still need mentors. Well, and, and yeah. even even the I think of one of one of my colleagues, Meg McRoberts, is on online with this. She comes from a tech professional technical writing background, and Git was not a familiar thing for her when she first started contributing to open source. And so, just things like and in introducing technical writers to Git and how you how we interact through Git is already yeah. a subtlety. That's not true, actually. I had worked for three other places where we used Git, oh. but everybody does it slightly differently. This is the first place that's used forks, and it's. I'm sure if I don't have profound knowledge of Git. And then it all makes sense, but so it was all different for each place. So, which is a, also something that other technical writers were run into too. Back to back to Oleg's point that open source contribution is really different. Yes. Okay, so yeah. Oleg, did that address your two questions on those last two topics? Let's do them by mailing list and and yeah, discuss that's perfectly them. Perfectly fine. Great. All right. Those are all the topics that we had for today. Anything else before we close the meeting? All right. I will flag the action items and post the recording. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you. Thank you. Meet again Bye. in four weeks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.